This picture shows the view from the Sky Bridge in the Scottish Highlands looking towards the Plock of Kyle, where the invasive leguminous shrub gorse has run riot. The main point of this presentation is that, thanks to nature, gorse dominance here is declining, quite swiftly changing into woodland. What follows is a discussion of observations made at the Plock showing the automatic change from dense gorse to young woodland over a relatively short time scale, entirely without human intervention or cost. This panoramic movie of the plot shows most phases of a woodland succession, from a closed canopy of gorse, unbroken yellow, left, open gorse with emergent trees in the middle of the picture and distance, and closed birch woodland with moribund or dead gorse in the shade beneath its canopy, foreground and right. In this photo, taken from the same viewpoint, we can see all of the various phases of ecological succession from gorse to woodland. Even the newest, densest gorse by the roadside contains significant numbers of tree saplings, some already emerged and just visible here. During one brave foray into its midst, to find out how the herb layer was progressing, two of us recorded an astonishing 163 plant species. Skeptics, please note, 163 plant species, including extensive patches of bluebells and 12 different ferns. This is an impressively rich community, woodland in waiting, which it would seem irrational to destroy by clearance and artificial tree planting, which would probably cause recolonisation by gorse. I'll show you exactly what I mean later in this presentation, my example taken at the Plock of Kyle. Until relatively recently, the plock was a nine-hole golf course. After it was abandoned sometime during the 1960s, the gorse invaded and grew vigorously. But just a few decades later, trees are irrepressibly replacing the gorse, a natural process we do not observe unless we watch and wait very patiently or opt to analyse and understand the ecological signs waiting to be interpreted. These photos show how vigorously gorse, then trees, are colonising the plock 50 years after the golf course days. Where once there was a golf course, now there are trees, mostly birch and rowan, early colonisers, creating a closed canopy with a characteristic woodland ground flora. In their shade, we can just identify the last remains of the once dominant gorse. Evolution of respectable young woodland has taken about 50 years. How long would it take to reach the same ecological condition after gorse controlled by conventional methods followed by tree planting. Gorse, also known as furs or whin, is a member of the botanical family Fabaceae, the legumes. It is native to Britain, but so often found on land disturbed by humans that it is difficult to be certain that any occurrence is in a genuinely natural situation. Gorse has brilliant yellow pea-like flowers, which when in bloom emit a subtle, distinctly coconut scent. Its fruits are small, flat pea pods that when ripe can be heard cracking on warm summer days. The seeds are hard, shiny and black. One of Gorse's great strengths as a land invader is that the seeds remain viable for around 30 years, patiently waiting for an opportunity to germinate, which they do enthusiastically when encouraged by mechanical intervention or subjected to passing fire. Fire is not only a natural hazard, Gorse burns fiercely, but it is also used in Gorse control, which of course helps to create more Gorse. When gorse has achieved maturity, stands can be quite dense, virtually impenetrable. Botanists are well advised to climb into some sort of PPE during their ecological surveys. Although shoots are soft when young and may be handled without injury, given prior consideration, gorse is a fiercely spiny shrub. As this courageous botanist knows from personal experience, it's bad enough trying to make your way into the dense bushes but it can be particularly painful when you do get in there. The old dry spines are very sharp. As the lightquake dirge so aptly puts it, the when shall prick thee to the bare bane. As it ages, gorse becomes too tall to maintain its upright, bushy attitude and branches sag, opening the canopy 
and allowing the ground flora, which has already been developing beneath, to flourish and diversify. It is then that trees that have been waiting patiently beneath the canopy are able to emerge. Course is at its best in spring as the trees are coming into leaf and blossom and its yellow dominates the landscape. However, occasional bushes may be found flowering at any time of year, here in August, rather incongruously alongside the purple heather, but showing it has great colour sense, and here in late October. It's December now, and if you dislodge the snow, you'll find gorse flowers. There is an old country adage that reflects this all year round flowering. When the gorse is out of bloom, kissing's out of fashion. Gorse is a highly invasive plant, but usually on land that has been artificially cleared of its natural vegetation and the soil disturbed. Gorse responds to human activity, disturbance. It thrives where the growing conditions have been rendered unfit for plants other than pioneers and primary colonisers, such as common weeds and gorse. That is until the initial gorse phase has passed and plant succession has been, as it were, rebooted. A few years after this happened, in 2008, the land, previously cattle and sheep grazing, was choked with dense gorse. Now, in 2020, the same area has been cleared again, with diggers, of course, to make some sort of temporary depot. I'll be watching to see if gorse colonises once more and what strategy contractors use to deal with it. Here we see an assortment of sites where gorse has moved in after anthropogenic disturbance. One, an area of conifer plantation that has been clear felled with big machinery. Two, the bare fissured rock of a road cutting. Three, Road verges persistently rattled by roads crews, clearing vegetation, opening ditches and other digging activities. 4. Vast areas of overgrazed hillside. And number 5. As promised, back to the Plock of Kyle and this new access road for which lovely bluebell woodland at least three times the area of the road itself was bulldozed away. The ecological harm done was bad enough, but this... We've warned the warden about the predictable outcome if the zillions of energetic little gorse seedlings were not rooted out. Local volunteers were ready to help, but the site remained untouched and this happened. In 2020, the bushes are about 10 feet high, spindly and dense. Such a cockeyed carry-on. Gorse can entirely take over extensive tracts of land, dense and impenetrable. Land managers do not like this. It is quite usual for a pest to provoke a hostile and not particularly reflective response from humans. Conventional gorse control methods tend to be unnecessarily aggressive, causing unacceptable ecological damage. Not to mention a repeat of the problem itself. There are several ways land managers seek to control gorse, often unsuccessful and rarely without detrimental environmental consequences. Probably the most popular is to saw bushes almost to ground level and, later when the basal buds have sprouted, apply a herbicide. Glyphosate is the weed killer of choice, the safety of which is highly controversial. If contractors fail, actually when contractors fail to complete this stage and nobody notices, back to square one. Some landowners opt to burn their problem gorse. Here are typical results in sequence. A condition of land where total clearance has been implemented presents all land managers with new problems as well as a poor starting point for the re-establishment of native or agricultural plant communities. At this site, the farmer will have been disappointed when, only four months after laborious clearance, the next vegetational phase was bracken. 
Now, onward to the purpose of this presentation. In this study, originally published in the magazine Conservation Land Management in 2012, the Plock of Kyle provided examples of every stage of the change from gorse to woodland. The same ecological succession can be observed anywhere gorse has taken hold. However, unlike the Plock, few sites will so conveniently provide the whole story. So we have to notice one phase here and another over there, work out what they represent and place them in order. I hope that having seen this video, more people will be able to observe this fascinating process happening, slowly in human terms, but efficiently as far as nature is concerned. Once this process has been observed and its implications realised, maybe more people will recognise ecology in action, stand back and let nature make amends for the errors we commit when arrogantly thinking the countryside is unable to manage itself. If conservation is your aim, because the makings of desirable successor communities are already present within a gorse stand, ready to roll as it were, not to mention several bird species it would be a pity to evict violently, this sit-back-and-wait method must be preferable to hacking back, winching out, bulldozing, fire and herbicide treatments. The alternative method proposed here exploits ecological processes already underway in any mature gorse stand and requires no or well, certainly very little, intervention. Just time, patient observation, and the informed confidence that nature will eventually prevail. As well as being environmentally considerate, the method also has the considerable advantage that labour and costs are minimised and could in many circumstances be zero. If you're a farmer, woodland will probably be, like a gorse or bracken invasion, a distinct impediment to your operations. So this presentation will be of little practical interest to you, other than where I explain why, because of Gorse's expertise at regeneration, conventional slash, poison and burn methods often injudiciously inflicted on Gorse might not be as effective for its control as land managers would wish. As we've already seen, it's easy enough to find failed Gorse control projects that demonstrate the limitations of conventional methods. Taking this non-interventional approach, Trees, protected within and nourished by soil improved by gorse, force their host shrub into gradual but irrevocable decline by outcompeting it for light. This contrasts markedly with familiar scenes of sawn-off stumps and burnt bushes that consistently recover, requiring further and repeated attention if eradication is ever to be achieved, and herbicide-intoxicated land with damaged soil and precious little vegetation. Trees nourished by soil improved by gorse, you ask? Nitrogen, a vital nutrient that plants acquire in forms such as nitrate or ammonium compounds, is deficient in many soils, either by its being rapidly used up or leaching down and out of the soil in aqueous solution. In common with other legumes, gorse is host to beneficial bacteria living in root nodules. These rhizobia absorb nitrogen, fixing it and making it available to their host, which donates much of it back to the soil where it can be utilised by other plants. Thus, gorse nourishes neighbouring plants. Moreover, reinstatement of native vegetation is not hindered by its having to overcome waves of germination by gorse and other weeds from seed banks. Most importantly, ecological disturbance is nil, leaving established soils and plant communities intact able to evolve progressively from the undoubted complexity they have already developed, protected by the gorse. If we wish to improve the landscape with woodland, we have choices. One, we can plant trees with the hope of creating something resembling woodland, or two, we can allow trees to grow naturally and evolve into real woodland. My somewhat discouraging presentation on the subject of tree planting for climate change, brainwave or pipe dream, deals with the probable outcomes of option one. The link is in the notes below. Option two, allow trees to grow naturally, presents land managers with several possibilities, all based on keeping out browsing animals that feed on and prevent growth of trees, deer for instance, and leaving the woodland succession from open land to thorny scrub to invasive pioneer trees, eventually becoming a mixed-age, mixed-species woodland ecosystem consisting not only of trees, but also a shrub layer, ground flora and stratified soil that are home to a mind-bogglingly complex population of animals, fungi, protists, 
so-called slime moulds and bacteria, etc., a self-supporting ecological community. Given favourable circumstances, some ecological understanding, patience and maybe a few novel ideas, this process can happen remarkably rapidly, as this presentation attempts to show. Of course, it's not an established method, but it's far from unique. A similar project has been underway in New Zealand these past 30 years. Successfully. This image encapsulates the transition from closed canopy gorse to fresh new woodland where gorse once was. The birch tree grew up through the lanky gorse and having emerged spread its branches shading the gorse which deprived of sufficient light is showing distinct signs of dying back. Beyond the birch the gorse is unaffected and then a little farther on a vigorous young rowan is slowly but surely killing its own nursery gorse. This section will follow the complete sequence from gorse thicket to New Woodland. Here is a dense, continuous gorse thicket. There are tree saplings lurking in this natural tree nursery and a few years later they have emerged and each, season by season, is beginning to extend its canopy to the detriment of the host gorse. There are plenty more little trees waiting down below. Birch and rowan are frequent early colonisers of gorse thickets. Birch seeds are small, light and numerous, soon finding their way onto the ground under the gorse. Seeds in juicy rowan fruits arrive plentifully in bird droppings. The young saplings of these pioneering trees get overlooked as they grow out of sight, deep within the impenetrable gorse. Eventually they emerge into the light, though even then they will probably remain unobserved. Having spent their adolescence becoming sturdy and well-established, all the saplings have to do now is continue growing and spread their canopy, shading the gorse and efficiently suppressing its growth. Season after season, the young trees enlarge and multiply. When well-grown and there are enough of them for the tree canopy to coalesce, a process well underway here, that will be the end of the gorse phase of this dynamic ecological succession. This once vigorous roadside gorse will soon have been completely outcompeted, leaving only road edge gorse where it is routinely mown. Trees don't survive mowing, while gorse regenerates from basal buds, albeit resulting in permanently restricted growth as long as the mowing routine continues. In places we can still find the weakened moribund gorse in the shade of invading trees. Let us stay down here to follow the death and disappearance of the gorse and automatic nature-mediated woodland creation. This table shows the sequence of transition. On the left, the decline of the gorse from dense thicket via suppression of the expanding tree canopy. Occasionally we can recognise the last remains of the gorse stalks, they're too skinny to merit the term trunks, and its eventual disappearance. On the right, the evolution of the new woodland. The following images all show the woodland phase happening at the Plock of Kyle. Here we are looking down on the closed birch canopy from a hillside knoll. Note top centre a patch of unaffected gorse. Now that you can see it, at first I didn't notice it myself. Let's return to the original picture. The tree canopy has closed and the gorse, completely shaded, has become tall, sparse and etiolated with soft spines. It no longer has the wherewithal for flowering. This gorse is on its last legs. Only branch tips show any sign of life. It's very weak, indeed moribund. And this picture hardly needs a caption. It shows the gorse equivalent of the Monty Python parrot. It has ceased to be. It says to bereft of life. It rests in peace. You really need to search for this scene. Gorse is almost unrecognisable last decomposing remains. After some 50 years of slow but sure ecological succession, the gorse is gone, replaced by young woodland. With time, there will be further change, 
as the short-lived pioneer birches give way to a mosaic of less opportunistic trees, holly, oak, hazel, witch elm, yew and others, depending on sources of seed. As the tree community changes, so will the ground layer plants and all the other organisms that constitute British woodland. You will have gathered that much of this information was obtained in the Scottish Highlands, though everywhere I've travelled I've had my eyes open looking for parallel ecological processes. At the opposite end of the UK, in Sussex, there is the fascinating NEP, that's spelt K-N-E-P-P, -P, wilding project. See links in the notes below, where what they call thorny scrub, an equivalent of gorse, is similarly changing into woodland. Here's what they say. We've been astonished by the diversity of trees and shrubs that have appeared of their own accord in the wildest part of the estate, including wild service, crabapple, hornbeam and sallow. Thousands of jay-planted oaks have also taken root, and those that have found protection in the thorny scrub are now up to 14 feet tall, a height they have reached in little more than a decade. Any saplings that germinate outside this thorny protection are soon browsed off. Eventually, as the protected trees mature, we expect they will shade out the underlying thorny scrub that nursed them, creating an open, park-like landscape characterised by groves and freestanding trees. The success of natural tree recruitment in this area is a useful demonstration of an alternative, low-cost way of establishing woodland, a system that was common practice in medieval times when thorny scrub was protected by law. Allowing thorny scrub to do the job of tree guards is not only infinitely cheaper, since it involves no human labour, it is more successful at establishing vigorous, disease-free plants, and it is environmentally sound, avoiding the pollution involved in the use of carbon-intensive polypropylene cylinders and tannalised wooden stakes. As this presentation was going through its final checks, one of my correspondents wrote to tell me about a New Zealander he once worked with, who had come up with not just a parallel, but the same observations that I have discussed here. More than that, though, he has put them to practical use over the past more than 30 years. New Zealand is troubled by massive infestations of gorse, which has run amok since its introduction from Europe in the early 1800s. Just as in Britain, it finds disturbed land, cleared for agriculture, an ideal habitat, and it has taken over vast tracts of countryside. Hugh Wilson created the 1,250 hectare Hinaway Reserve on the Banks Peninsula, South Island, in 1987 and simply left the gorse infestation to its own devices. The property naturally reverted from gorse-covered pasture to native forest, just as we have observed happening at the Plock of Kyle. A link to a documentary, Fools and Dreamers, about the project is with the notes below. I've always been a little diffident about my eccentric ideas, expecting to be contradicted before long, but the Hinaway experience plus the NEP project are providing vindication. Phew! It is worth noting that exactly the same process has been observed in which trees, in this case ash, suppress another aggressively invasive, light-demanding plant, bracken. If leaving thorny scrub or bracken to their own devices is an effective, efficient, environmentally considerate way of controlling problem plants, while creating woodland, the method should be applicable, appropriately adapted to many other situations and localities, anywhere in Britain, indeed in the world, where circumstances allow.